sorry, we had an internet dropout and then we had some audio flubs. Um, we will be taping this, so if anybody ends up having to leave before we, um, we finish, since our webinar will be about 45 minutes to an hour, we will be um, sending out the link and you can always um, watch this in an unlive version. So thank you again for attending our webinar. Uh, please ask your questions via the chat feature and we will be sending out uh, answers to all those questions via email after the webinar if we do not get a chance to answer it before this hour is over. I'm going to quickly introduce the panel. On my right is Brittany Jenner, Application Engineer here at Sontech. Hi everyone. My name is Karen Dubay. I'm the Director of Product Management at Sontech. And to my left is Alex Tardy. He's our special guest from NOAA. He's the Warning Coordination Meteorologist Manager at NOAA National Weather Service San Diego, where he works with a variety of public and part private partners communicating weather and hazard information in order to save lives and property. He has worked at the National Weather Service for 22 years. Welcome, Alex. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. So what's El Nino and why do I care? El Nino has been on the public radar for the past 30 years, pretty much since the 1982-83 event. Depending on where you live, you may associate it with poor fishing conditions, increased rain, or even drought. It is actually much more complex than a simple storm or weather system, such as a hurricane, but is instead the name for a periodic coupled ocean atmosphere phenomena that can last many months. When we talk about El Nino, we often talk about the sea surface temperatures, or SSTs, along the equatorial Pacific being warm. This is normal. SSTs along the equator are warmer than the surrounding waters. The difference is that in El Nino period, these waters are warmer than normal, especially in the eastern Pacific. So when we talk about El Nino and the effects of El Nino, we are talking about anomalies. An anomaly is when something differs from a normal condition. During El Nino, we can expect to see regional anomalies, predominantly more or less rain, and warmer or cooler temperatures. These climate changes affect a large portion of the Earth, from the eastern Indian Ocean, across the Pacific and Americas, all the way to the Atlantic Basin. This slide shows a normal year's circulation on the left, and on the right, what is to occur in order to trigger an El Nino. Let's now discuss the equatorial ocean atmosphere circulation for a typical year in detail. Typical circulation in the Pacific Basin features low-level winds, typically referred to as the trade winds. The trade winds blow from east to the west. The winds cause a buildup of warm waters and lead to an upwelling of nutrient-rich cooler waters in the east. Evaporation and convection is high over regions of warm water, especially when the water exceeds 28 degrees C, leading to the precipitation over the western tropical Pacific and Indonesia. This is the normal climatic circulation pattern. Now we will take a closer look at what happens before an El Nino. In order for conditions to be right for El Nino, lower air pressure sets up over the eastern tropical Pacific and higher air pressure takes hold over Indonesia and northern Australia. This change in gradient weakens or completely stops the trade winds over the central and eastern Pacific. With no winds pushing the warm water to the west, the warm pool moves further to the central and eastern Pacific. This leads to weakened cool water upwelling along the South American coast, enhanced convection in the areas where SST exceeds 28C, leading to increased precipitation in the central and eastern Pacific. This sets up the circulation that impacts the path of the jet stream amongst the host of other changes in weather patterns associated with El Nino. The name El Nino was originally coined by Peruvian fishermen. At the end of the calendar year, SSTs increased along the coasts of Ecuador and northern Peru. Local residents referred to this annual warming as El Nino, meaning the child, due to its appearance around Christmas time. The appearance of El Nino signified the end of the fishing season and the time for the Peruvian fishermen to repair their nets and perform maintenance on their boats. Every two to seven years, the warming was more extreme and lasted several months. It was additionally often accompanied by heavy rainfall in the typically arid coastal regions of Ecuador and Peru. 
In the 1960s, scientists linked the conditions along the coast of South America with anomalously warm waters throughout the equatorial Pacific. Over time, the term El Nino started to refer exclusively to this abnormally warm period and the weather associated with it. Scientists say that El Nino has been around for thousands of years. Only since the start of modern weather record keeping can we exactly place and quantify El Nino. Looking at the chart on the left, you can see a categorization of El Ninos as weak, moderate, strong, and very strong. Only two events are categorized as very strong in 1982-83 and 1997-98. While close to the magnitude of the 1982-83 El Nino, the 1997-98 El Nino was unique because it was the first El Nino observed and forecast by NOAA. This was the start of a new age of climate forecasting and preparedness. So what weather and associated impacts are associated with El Nino? Well, during El Nino, we typically see more rain across the entire United States in the south only. Some regions in Central and South America, such as the coastal areas of Peru and Ecuador, southern and northeastern Brazil, and Argentina. Argentina has seen some of the worst flooding in the last 30 years just in this past month, past month affecting agriculture. Below normal rain would be expected in Australia and areas of Southeast Asia. Drought would be expected to cause crop reductions in regions such as Indonesia and the Philippines. In the 1997-98 El Nino, excessive rain in Florida prompted a fast growth of vegetation creating fuel for a record fire season in the year that followed. El Nino encourages more hurricanes in the Pacific. For the first time just last week, three Category 3 or higher hurricanes had formed in the Pacific Basin at the same time. And in the Atlantic, we would expect to see fewer hurricanes. Alex, maybe you can explain to us why this would be true. Yeah, it's a great question. You would think with the warmer waters that the um, hurricane season would be more active. What happens in El Nino? is we see a little bit of impact of our jet stream and just a little bit more wind in the upper levels, 5 to 10 miles per hour, and that is what we call wind shear. Hurricanes don't like that, and it tends to rip them apart and prevent them from getting stronger or even forming at all in the Atlantic. So we see a significant decrease in hurricane activity in the Atlantic Ocean during El Nino, especially strong ones. Now, on the flip side in the Pacific, they don't experience that wind shear, and they encounter the very warm water, and that's why you see the explosive hurricane activity that you just mentioned and is ongoing even now. Thanks, Alex. Another impact we can expect to see is in the oceans off the west coast of South America, where the decreased upwelling brings less nutrient-rich cold water to the surface and a decrease in the fishery yields. The economic impact goes beyond agriculture and fisheries. In 1997-98, the drought in Panama led to a lowering of the water level in the Panama Canal, which reduced shipping loads and increased shipping costs. And in Peru, floods during previous El Ninos have flooded their zinc mines, resulting in higher prices for the metal. Similar impacts occurred in the Chilean copper mines. 1982-83 was the first modern, very strong El Nino that was studied in detail, including the economic impact. During that event, there were an unusually large number of Central Pacific hurricanes, with five hitting French Polynesia alone, and the strongest hurricane on record up until that time to hit Hawaii. In contrast, only six tropical storms formed in the Atlantic Basin, and only two became hurricanes. In Australia, there was a prolonged drought, currently regarded as one of the most severe in the region, and that has occurred in the last 100 years. In total, over $9 billion in damages were found to be a direct result of El Nino in 1982-83. As the first major El Nino to be forecast, the 1997-98 event was the warmest and wettest on record in the United States. But it proved that damages could be limited with proper planning. In the United States, many agencies took the warning seriously. Both FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers made mitigation plans. The Geological Survey and the Bureau of Reclamation worked to more effectively manage western water supplies in rivers and reservoirs. And the Environmental Protection Agency acted to minimize environmental damage. Even individual residents of California got into the act, spending $125 million on home and business repairs in preparation for the predicted rain and flooding. 
Altogether, residents of the state and the state government of California invested $165 million in mitigation efforts. A study found that due to this planning, the damages in California during the 1997-98 El Nino were $1.1 billion, which is only half of what was incurred in the 1982-83 event. So what did these agencies do to contain damages exactly? In California, water managers instructed the clearing of debris from ditches, canals, and river channels, allowing greater volumes of water to flow and reducing the potential for flooding. In Florida, the water levels in lakes and canals were reduced to make room for storage. Water managers in the U.S. western states developed summer 1998 water distribution schedules based on the expected rains, while the U.S. Midwest water managers made plans for long-term river control operations based on lower river and lake levels due to the anticipated below average precipitation. And hydropower plant managers used the information to predict spring runoff amounts. We've been hearing about this current El Nino for many months now, and people are starting to take notice. In anticipation, Peru has already declared an emergency in 14 regions. The Philippines have altered their agricultural planting schedule. The WMO is saying it could be one of the strongest El Ninos in the last 65 years. And NOAA has released an El Nino advisory. Now to discuss the latest predictions from the United States National Weather Service, we welcome our special guest, Alex Tardy. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, NOAA just released the new outlook today. Some of you might have already been able to join uh, that conference call and get some new information. We're going to talk about El Nino and how it impacts California and really much of the globe in terms of precipitation and also how it doesn't impact with precipitation and actually enhances drought and warmth in other parts of the globe. Here's a typical pattern you expect for North America, at least, with an enhanced jet stream. So what happens is the warm ocean temperatures in the Equatorial Pacific Ocean that you just learned about. In the wintertime, when the jet stream normally drops further south and the sun angle gets low, cold air builds up over the North Pole, that jet stream is usually across Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. But in El Nino, it gets drawn further south. So the contrast between that warm water that remains all the way through the winter and the cold air coming down from the north magnifies the jet stream and shifts it further south so you get an increased storm track cutting across Southern California, Texas, and Florida as shown here. Now this is typically what we expect with El Nino in much of California and parts of the South United States is flooding and too much rain. We'll go into some information that shows that that's not always the case, but that it is a good correlation at least for Southern California. Right now, this is what the Pacific looks like, including the El Nino region. Your eyes are probably drawn to a few areas. The bottom of your screen is the El Nino area stretching from west to east along the equator. Significant warming that we'll discuss in detail. Now there's another region just offshore of California, and that's been called the Blob. It's been around for a couple of years, and it's really now located across all of the eastern Pacific right up to the California coast. Also notice there's quite a bit of warm water above normal sea surface temperatures in the northern Pacific as well. So it, overall, the entire Pacific is above normal with sea surface temperatures. Here's an animation of those same sea surface temperatures. I want you to focus on two areas that are shown here. The rectangle is the ENSO region, or the El Nino area that we look for warming of sea surface temperatures. Since this animation is five years long, you can see early on in 2010 and 11, there was a lot of cool water in the Enso region. But notice the North Pacific. There was large areas of warm water dating back all the way to 2011 and 12, as shown here. And that warm water was sloshing back and forth, expanding, shrinking. And then eventually, late in 2013 and in 2014, that warm water expanded all the way to the west coast, as shown right here. Now, notice the El Nino region didn't really change much. It warmed and cooled, relatively stayed neutral along the equator up until most recently. And we saw some significant warming, as shown in upcoming slides here, 
the May, June time frame and up to currently a lot of warming in the El Nino region. So two different areas that we're going to focus on. Again, the El Nino region is not a tropical storm, it's not one storm, it's not a thunderstorm, and it's not even tropical moisture that comes up from Hawaii like we refer to as the Pineapple Express. But what it does do is that the warm water that's generating those thunderstorms in convection, like now we see in the ocean and the hurricanes, what that does is it develops a new circulation that will eventually interact with the jet stream, which is the normal circulation that comes down from the north. When those two interact, you get significant changes. We call it coupling of the ocean and the atmosphere. They work together in tandem. And you get that enhanced Pacific jet stream that's drawn further south and impacting the southern part of the United States. So that is important to remember you know, the El Nino is not one storm, it's not a hurricane, it's not even tropical moisture, but it is warm ocean temperatures that interact with the jet stream and the atmosphere and the ocean work together eventually. It does take some time, though, into the winter for that to really happen. El Ninos come in different shapes and sizes. They're not, they're not all apples. It's apples and oranges. Here's, a, here's some El Ninos of the past and several El Ninos that were strong on the left-hand side and other ones that were more in the weak to moderate and you can see that the center of the El Nino has been different in a lot of the past El Nino events. This here shows different El Ninos over the past few decades. And it also correlates it to how wet was it across California. Well, 82, 83, 97, 98 were very wet. Those are the benchmark El Nino years. Not only were they strong El Ninos, but they delivered widespread precipitation much above normal and the impacts associated with that, which you just learned about, across the entire state of California, and even in places across the western and southern United States. However, when you remove those years and you look at other El Ninos, it's been a mixed bag. Some of them have been dry, especially like 91, 92 in northern California. 2006 and 7 was also a dry year. And most recently, 2009 and 10, that just brought average precipitation across all of California. And so it's important to separate some of these El Ninos because they don't all have the same impact and they certainly don't always guarantee widespread precipitation in California. Here's a look at some of those El Ninos when you look at the numbers and how they're ranked. When you look at an El Nino and you rank it from one to three, when it gets up above two, that's a strong El Nino. And we've only had a handful of those most noticeable here, 82, 83, and 97, 98. But also, 72, 73 was a strong El Nino. And these numbers on the right for precipitation are for San Diego. We only had average precipitation. You can look at other years, like 2002, 2003, precipitation was only average. And 86, 87, precipitation was actually below average despite El Nino. So what this is telling us is, yes, the strong El Ninos do have a correlation to precipitation in San Diego and Southern California. And overall, when you average them together, you definitely come out with above normal precipitation for all the El Ninos together. But again, they're not apples and apples because there's quite a bit of difference in what actually the result is and what the impact is on these various El Ninos historically. Okay, with El Nino, we also need to talk a little bit about the drought and what is it going to take to end what we're experiencing in the most severe drought of the past four years historically for, for California. Consecutive four years of blown over precipitation. So what we would need from El Nino and the jet stream would be about 150% of normal precipitation. And that's got to go across the Sierra Nevada, and, and that's also got to deliver a big snowpack before we even get close to anything called the drought buster. We're not expecting those conditions necessarily, however. Past El Ninos, as I showed you, are variable in precipitation. Strong to moderate El Ninos have good correlation, but just to Southern California. And most importantly, it's not just rain. We need a high snowpack. We need above normal snowpack because that's what feeds the reservoirs across the Great Basin and especially California. Here's a perspective of the drought. And over the past four consecutive years, this is the worst drought in California. California is missing about 26 inches of precipitation when you accumulate it over those four years. 
And the dark red areas are where one to two seasons, so it's as if one to two winters didn't even occur across those parts of California. Note that's a good chunk of the southern Sierra Nevada, and that's also most of coastal and just inland areas of Southern California. Big deficit in precipitation. All right, here's what strong El Ninos tend to do. On the left-hand side, we list all the recent strong El Ninos. NOAA only categorizes El Ninos as weak, moderate, or strong. And the jet stream comes in through Central California, dips across Texas, and out through Florida or the Southeast United States. Notice on the right, though, when you remove those two benchmark years, 82, 83, 97, 98, the signal goes away and it shrinks. It remains across coastal California, part of the southwest desert in Texas and part of Florida. But you lose a lot of that signal in northern California and the Pacific Northwest. So what that's telling you is that we've only really had two big El Ninos that have delivered widespread significant precipitation across California. Again, that was 82, 83, winter, and 97, 98. Here's a jet stream of what we've seen over the past two years it's on the left-hand side, pretty much missing California. That's your upper-level ridge of high pressure or the large rock in the river of the atmosphere that has been blocked and causing storms to go well north of us and missing the state for two consecutive years. Now, on the right-hand side is what has happened in historical strong El Ninos. You see the jet stream takes a direct track. It doesn't come up from the tropics, but it takes a direct west-east track across central California through Texas and the southern part of the United States. Big difference in pattern. Here's when you compare it to normal. So the past couple of years have been extremely warm across the Pacific. This is the upper levels of the atmosphere. So what this reflects is the jet stream has just not been around. We've had a big ridge of high pressure, and that warm air that's created for the absence of storm is also what's been forming the warm water over the Pacific and causing that blob that we showed earlier. Notice the northern part and eastern part of Canada has been very cold. A lot of cold air over the past two years has been allowed to come down. That's enhanced our snowstorms and also brought a lot of Arctic outbreaks. Now, on the right-hand side is what you typically expect in a strong El Nino. Notice the difference. It's about 108 degrees difference in the Pacific and in eastern Canada. So instead of all that warm air, lack of storm track, the storm track, as shown there, is shifted much further south. The storm track is what separates cold and warm air. And that storm track is pointed right on California, especially southern California, during those historically strong El Ninos. The warm air? As shown in the right, you get a lot of warm air in that part of the atmosphere, and also that's what developed our big ice storm we saw in the northeast in 97, 98. All right, so on the left-hand side, this is the past two years again, but now we're looking at sea surface temperatures. And in the past two years is really where the blob or the warm ocean temperatures in the eastern Pacific have materialized, and much above normal sea surface temperatures have been present even before El Nino. That's important to note, even before El Nino on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is what you expect in your typical strong El Ninos. You have that focus of warm ocean temperatures across the equator, and some of that bleeds northward into the California Baja and even on the California coast and across South America. So, so far in the past couple of years, before El Nino developed, we already had all this warm water in the eastern and northern Pacific. All right, so when we look at all the El Ninos on the left-hand side, what we're doing is we're correlating it to precipitation. Blue shade is above normal, and the orange and red is below normal. During the whole course of a winter, not one month, whole course of a winter. A lot of blue shows up across the Southland with all El Ninos, and we discuss why that is with a jet stream. When you remove some of those big El Ninos, like the three strong ones of 72, 82, 97, those winners. Not only do you shrink the area blue, you develop a very dry bias across northern California. Very important for implications in drought, and that is the caveat with El Nino and why El Nino doesn't guarantee or necessarily mean above normal rainfall or precipitation in the West. One example here is 1965-66. That year it started off very wet. We had a healthy El Nino, kind of like what looking at right now. But unfortunately, it started to weaken as we went into the winter. And the impacts weakened as well, and the jet stream changed its course. It started off November and December very wet in Southern California. 
But what ended up happening when you looked at the whole winter as a whole, and that's what's important to look at, October through April, our rainy season, Northern California ended up much drier than normal. So what started off good turned out to be a very poor year of precipitation despite that strong El Nino. Scripps, which is located in La Jolla, University of California, San Diego, they've done some research recently. And on the left-hand side, they do a good job summing up what I just said. The blue shade is how we correlate to El Nino and, and how precipitation specifically correlates to El Nino. The blue shade shows that coastal California and Southern California has a very good correlation to El Nino. However, in the middle, when you look at the wettest storms, so what are the big top 5% storms, the heaviest rain, the big one-week storms across California? The Sierra Nevada doesn't have any correlation to El Nino, and even parts of Southern California lose a little bit of correlation. The coast keeps it, however. So we can, on coastal California and in the desert and the far southern part of California, our wettest storms and our El Nino storms tend to go coincident or they coincide together. The remaining storms, however, on the right-hand side, those are about the 95% of storms, so not your big soakers. Those have a very good correlation across Southern California with El Nino. Notice Northern California actually starts to lose again. So that was reflected in our prior slides, but this sums it up nicely on this slide um, from Scripps. All right, our two big years, our textbooks years, are 82, 83, 97, 98. And the reason why those are the two big years is that across California, not only was it wet, it was one of the wettest years ever. So 82, 83 for Northern California goes down as the wettest year on record, and it happens to be a strong El Nino as well, so very good correlation. Then 97, 98, that ended up being the same type of year, very wet across northern and coastal and even southern California. These are our two benchmark years. This is what tends to happen when you put together the strong El Ninos of the past. Northern California, shown here, starts to get wet sometime in October, then it spreads southward in November. Then you have a little bit of a retreat where the atmosphere and the ocean are likely trying to couple together where El Nino is really uh, starting to feel its impact, but we're not yet seeing the rainfall. Notice, though, January, February, and March, and that's important because the latter half of the winter tends to be very wet with El Nino. And as shown here, historically, the past six strong El Ninos, that was the case. The atmosphere and the ocean started working together, or coupled as we call it, and we had big impacts, heavy rain, persistent storm tracks, storm after storm, bringing wet months of February and March. All right. You're probably wondering what the current El Nino looks like, and this is the latest image here. So the rectangle area is our El Nino area. It's along the equator, the Pacific, from about the date line all the way to South America. It is in a moderate state right now, and it continues to expand. Also notice the other area, the arrow, the large one, that's our blob in the central and northern Pacific. That is also something we have not seen before with any El Nino. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But it's important because that blob of warm water was already there before El Nino. It's likely the result of our lack of storminess over the past two years that's really allowed the ocean temperatures to warm. Nonetheless, El Nino continues to expand, and the heart of it is right where it should be for a strong El Nino this time of year. All right, we also look below the water because the El Nino zone needs a reservoir of warm water. We don't want a year like 65, 66, or even 2012 and 13, where we saw a healthy El Nino developing and then it fell apart come December. Because remember, we need it timed with the most powerful jet stream in the world, which is the Pacific jet stream. We need it timed with that. We need the two to work together and be at their peak. So underneath the ocean, we do see a lot of warm water. So what that does is tells us there's a lot of confidence that El Nino isn't going to go away. It's not even going to weaken because there's so much warm water down below. Here's what it looks like over the past year. The El Nino regions that we monitor on the left-hand side focus on, for example, Nino 3.4, which is about 2.1, which is a very healthy El Nino as we speak right now. On the right-hand side, you can see that region has really taken off since May. And last year in 2014, even though we were talking about El Nino, it never really developed or materialized. So we never even got a chance to change the atmosphere. These are our computer models, and what they're projecting is what the ocean temperatures are going to be along the equatorial Pacific Ocean. 
and focus on the yellow line. That's the average of all of them. And these are models from Europe, from Canada, from NASA, from Scripps, from NOAA. A lot of different models used here to simulate sea surface temperatures. What we're predicting is about a 2.5 Celsius. That's a big number. That could go down as the strongest El Nino ever in terms of sea surface temperatures if that were to materialize later this fall into early winter. So the impacts of El Nino, like we discussed, tend to be wet in Southern California and cooler weather in Texas and Florida. But it also brings dry and warm weather in parts of the, of the entire world, as shown here. So in your area, there's different impacts. It certainly may not be increased storminess or precipitation. It might be worsening drought conditions or warmer than normal or record-breaking temperatures, as shown here. So El Nino has a lot of impact. It's not the only influence on our atmosphere on any given year or even when it's strong, but it does have a big impact that's really international. Across the United States, this is what we're expecting. Uh, above normal precipitation should be focused across far southern California, Texas, and Florida because of the reasons we discussed. With drier than normal conditions and worsening drought across the Pacific Northwest, as shown here. So the confidence is higher across Southern California, and confidence is actually quite poor for Northern California to have above normal precipitation. And again, this is December through February, which is not the entire winter, but it is the heart of our normal winter season. For temperatures, we see those cooler than normal conditions expected across Texas because of clouds and rain. Southern California will be dominated by that relatively mild Pacific air due to the jet stream. The Pacific Northwest and the Upper Plains, what will happen there is we will see a lot of Arctic intrusions because of the split in the jet stream and the main jet stream coming across the Pacific Ocean into Southern California. So you tend to get limited amount of Arctic air, and overall you end up being much above normal across the northern states. Here's a zoom up of Southern California. You can see the confidence is where we are located here in San Diego, between LA and San Diego. That's where we because historically what strong El Ninos have done, the most confidence for above normal precipitation. And with above normal precipitation comes increased impacts um, from that rainfall. Okay, in summary, El Nino is already developed and it's in a moderate state over the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. Very good chance we'll see strong conditions develop later this fall. Remember that strong phase of the El Nino does correlate well to precipitation being above normal at least for Southern California and parts of the lower 48. El Nino can impact the jet stream and bring more frequent storms, not necessarily your strongest or stronger storms. El Nino does guarantee or does not guarantee the above normal precipitation, and there's been several dry years. So we really need to consider those dry years, especially for water planning and the impact on the drought. Speaking of the drought, that four-year drought is about one to two seasons of precipitation loss. Here's some impacts and actions you can take. Uh, El Nino is not tropical storms, so we do get moderate snow levels. So that is good news if we can get that jet stream to focus across central California like it did in 97, 98. However, on the flip side, the negative side, too much repeated storminess will bring flooding, saturated soils. It also can lead to uh, coastal erosion, erosion, beach erosion, high surf. So, for those of you in flood-prone areas or in urban areas, it's really important now that we start cleaning drains out. We have not seen what could occur with this El Nino, the type of rainfall, especially for Southern California, for years, some cases five to 25 years, some cases back to 97, 98. Also, we've had a lot of fires in California. So if you live near or downstream of any burn scar, it's very important to be uh, aware of the potential it won't take a whole lot of rain to cause those, and those will be the areas that go first once we start getting stormy this winter. You can also check out uh, the Department of Water Resources website to see if you are in one of those flood-prone areas, because you may not know. What can you do as a, a business, as a government agency, as academia, as a nonprofit? You can join the Weather Ready Nation uh, initiative. You can become a Weather Ready Nation ambassador. And what that means is you're promoting and educating and sharing information like this so that people can prepare better and they understand weather and changes in weather much better. And so that we can reduce impact and become more resilient. You can join it on the website shown here, and it's free. You can become a Weather Ready Nation ambassador. 
thanks, Alex. I think we'll be joining and becoming a Weather Ready Nation ambassador very soon. Next, I'd like to turn it over to our last speaker. And if you recall, we'll be saving questions. If we don't get answered during the next presentation, they will be answered at the end. Um, so Brittany is going to talk about some mitigation, ways to mitigate uh, uh, flooding, planning, and different measurement techniques. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm going to go over um, what our instruments do. Um, we have acoustic dapplers and CTD technology that can be used to monitor water resources. Um, so I'm going to give a few examples of how our instruments can be used um, during some of these impacts of El Nino or maybe to prepare for the impacts or sometimes um, to help clean up afterwards. Um, so here's just a uh, graphic showing some of our instruments. Um, the Sontech instruments are specifically outlined in orange. So the top um, is our CTD. This is a conductivity, temperature, and pressure sensor. Over here, we've got our river surveyor. This is used to measure discharge. Down on the bottom, we have our flow tracker, also used to measure discharge, also can be used to measure point velocities. And then over here, we have our Sontech IQ and then our Sontech SL. These are um, both acoustic Doppler profilers, and one is mounted on the bottom of a channel, one is mounted on the side, and they can be used in um, perhaps irrigation or just um, discharge uh, monitoring applications. So Dopplers, what, what do they do? Um, they measure velocity and depth. Um, and our meters, if you input a channel geometry, it can actually calculate the channel area, the discharge or flow, and also the total volume. Now, there are two essentially different types of acoustic dopplers. There are instantaneous and continuous. Continuous are shown here um, in orange. So this is our Sontech SL on the top and our uh, Sontech IQ on the bottom. These would be fixed mounted, so you would go and install them um, at a site. You have to provide power, and then you would leave them, um, essentially set it and forget it, and you'd be collecting data continuously. And if you connected it to, say, a data logger, you could actually have um, data sent to real time back to the office. So you could be measuring um, velocity or discharge, um, and then uh, be alerted if you are expecting a flood with rising discharge or velocity. Our other instruments are instantaneous. So these are here in green. And they are instruments you would physically take out to the field to obtain a measurement. And then you bring it back to the office. Uh, on the right side is our river surveyor. This is collecting velocity profiles and bathymetry. And then it's able to calculate a discharge. On the left-hand side is our flow tracker. This is collecting a point velocity measurement. And as you move across, uh, the channel, you're entering your geometry, and then ultimately you're going to get your discharge value. So these are used in a, a variety of applications, and now I'm going to get into a few examples of how these can be used. Um, and we talked a lot about um, the impacts being either flooding or possibly uh, drought, and in both situations, it's important to be able to quantify the amount of water you have. Um, so this is a great example of flooding and needing to get out and make a discharge measurement. And this is an old example. It's from 2008. It's, it's not related to El Nino, but it's a great example because it shows how one single instrument is able to make a measurement um, in an environment that it couldn't before. So down here in the bottom is um, uh, I'm showing the speed of the cross section, and we have the floodplains on the edges. And then over here, and then in the center of the channel, you can see the red and yellow indicating higher speeds in the center of the channel. So this is just a great example of the first time we were able to collect an entire flow measurement, including the floodplains on the Mississippi. So now if we look at um, examples related specifically to um, El Nino, in uh, May and June of this year in Texas, there was uh, a lot of heavy uh, rain and flooding. Uh, 
correlated directly with El Nino. And this example here is from the Environmental Institute of Houston. The, the site you can see the picture on the right-hand side is what they would call a flow tracker site, which means it's a weightable site. So they typically take their flow tracker out, and they actually get in the stream and walk across making their measurements. Um, on this day in May, uh, rains were so high, it was flooding, it was deemed um, unsafe to get in the water. So they luckily had a river surveyor that's um, in their toolbox. They were able to take that out and um, get their discharge data. So this next example um, was provided from the Trinity River Authority. This is uh, the Trinity River in Texas flowing right here. Their normal measurement is indicated by the pin here, and then there's this lock structure downstream. Um, so they provided this photo of the lock structure. You can see this is your normal base flow conditions, um, which you typically expect, um, but during June of this year, there was um, extreme flooding, and again, this is linked with El Nino. Um, you can't even see the top of the lock structure. It's, uh, it's right um, near the trees over here. Um, but they were able to take their river surveyor out there and collect data. Um, so I don't have uh, discharge data to share with you, but uh, these, this is pretty cool data because what they did was they uh, positioned the instrument in the middle of the stream. They kept it stationary. And because they had uh, GPS integrated, they were able to um, uh, know exactly what their position was from GPS. And that's indicated by these yellow lines here. And they also had bottom tracking, which is already equipped on the instrument. That's how it, it's able to track itself as it moves across um, a stream or a cross section. And that's indicated by the blue. So what you're seeing here, they're holding the instrument in one place, but the blue lines are moving upstream, and that's an indication of a moving bed, which means that it was flooding so much that it was picking up sediment and boulders on the bottom um, and moving that downstream, which is ultimately going to bias your discharge low if you were to only use bottom track. But because they had GPS, um, connected, they were able to rely on their GPS track and actually get their discharge data. So the second example I have from the Trinity River um, is um, from the from the second day, or sorry, from the next day on June 9th. They um, they went out to the site, and the entire area was flooded. Um, they actually ended up making a, a cross section shown here in the red line. This was a two-mile wide cross-section. I think it was actually wider than two miles, just slightly. Um, and they chose their cross-section down here because they made a few measurements beforehand, um, shown here with the orange stars. And from these three measurements, they were able to start to notice that uh, flow wasn't going exactly as they normally see it. Um, so indicated here in the white circle, um, typically water is flowing this way downstream, but in this section, they realized it was flowing the opposite direction, and they were able to uh, detect that with their river surveyor. And so they chose their cross-section downstream up here so they could capture the entire flow that was moving through this area. They also sent along um, this great photo, aerial photo, so you can see this is the cross-section in red, and then the highway behind it, you can see here, is um, down here in the bottom. So you can see that that entire area was flooded. Um, and then if we look at the, uh, the cross section, this is a screenshot of the software, we can see down in the bottom panel is our uh, speed and bathymetry. And we've got our floodplains on the edges here showing low velocities. And then over on the other side, we've got our floodplain as well. And then in the center is our actual channel. And we can see that red color indicating higher speeds, as you would expect, in the actual channel. So the river surveyor is um, uh, a multi-frequency acoustic Doppler. And it can be used for discharge applications, like I was just talking about. But it can also be used with our hydro surveyor software, which is used for bathymetry. And this example isn't necessarily related to El Nino, 
but we ha when we think about the impact of El Nino, we have to think about the possible damage that might occur if there's increased flooding. Um, so in the UK, there was uh, flooding in December of 2013. It actually broke one of their flood barriers, and they needed to get it fixed as soon as possible because they expected uh, rain to continue through the winter. So they took our hydro surveyor out um, on a remote-controlled boat, and um, they were able to map the bathymetry shown in the upper right, and they were able to then plan and um, repair the floodplain in a very timely manner. So the hydro surveyor can be used perhaps after a flood, um, but more importantly, you probably want to use it before for, for planning of floods and thinking about storage capacity. Um, you might want to lower water levels um, in your reservoirs or canals. So you could take the hydro surveyor out to map the bathymetry of your reservoir to then calculate how much storage capacity you have. So here's an example. This is the center of the Wash Reservoir. It's in California near the border of Arizona. Um, the colorful lines you see are actually uh, the raw sounding data. So these are the echo sounder almost, or the, just the, the raw depth data. Um, and it's color coded from deep, from deep water to shallow. Um, and the, the data are essentially where we, the boat track, where we uh, drove the boat around. And then we can take these raw data and interpolate them into a full-scale interpolated map. And then you can use this interpolated data to then calculate um, the total volume of the reservoir um, and then start to think about whether or not you need to lower water levels in preparation for um, probable flooding. So the other thing you're probably noticing um, are these little icons here. These are castaway CTG icons. So again, our, our castaway is a conductivity, temperature, and pressure sensor. Um, here's a picture of it. It's very small. You can hold it in the, in the palm of your hand. And it can be deployed either just by uh, holding it under the water to get a point measurement, or you can actually um, lower it down the entire depth of the water column and pull it back up and get a profile of these variables, and then from the conductivity, temperature, and pressure, you can calculate a sound speed. Um, you know, perhaps something like this not only is important for um, calculating the proper sound speed for your acoustic technology to then um, give you the right depth, but it could also be used in coastal applications if you're um, monitoring perhaps upwelling. You could use um, the castaway for temperature and salinity profiles near the coast. So why this is really important with a hydro surveyor software is that it's going to actually correct for um, the sound speed and that's going to give you an even more accurate bathymetry. So during the survey, as we're collecting our bathymetry data, we are deploying the castaway periodically. And this is happening, of course, over time and throughout space. And what the software does, the HydroSevere software, automatically integrates this over time and space and applies the sound speed correction for, again, a more accurate depth um, calculation. And therefore, your storage capacity is going to be even more accurate. So that's um, important for planning in flood management. So I talked about um, a few examples. Um, shown here in the upper right is when I is our river surveyor. I talked about um, you know instantaneous discharge measurements during floods and why that's important. I also talked about our hydro surveyor and how that can be used for bathymetry, um, either for storage uh, calculations or perhaps for um, repairing um, issues afterwards. And then also talked about the castaway. Um, I didn't touch on our Sontech IQ or our Sontech SL, um, but those could also be used um, during, um, you know, preparation or during the impacts of El Nino. They could be, um, you know, because they're continuous instruments, they're going to be installed collecting data. And again, you could have um, data being sent back to the office so you could be alerted if your stage is rising or your velocity is rising. Um, and then we also have instruments for uh, monitoring ocean currents um, and um, waves as well. 
Thanks, Brittany. Since we're coming up on about an hour from when we actually started due to technical difficulties, we have just a few minutes, maybe five minutes. So I'd like to um, point out some resources here um, and take some questions. I'm going to take a couple questions uh, that were uh, given to Alex, and, and we'll see where time takes us. Alex, you want to read the question? Answer? OK, thanks. Yeah, here's the questions that I got. Um, is the Pineapple Express related to El Nino? Well, the short answer is no. So Pineapple Express is uh, actual moisture and storm systems coming up from Hawaii or near Hawaii. And all it is is one form of atmospheric river. So we get atmospheric rivers any season, but we also get them with El Nino, and they tend to be more frequent. But uh, Pineapple Express is a separate phenomenon. So sure, you can get them in an El Nino year. But historically, if you look at the years like 1993, January, uh, January 97, or even February 1986, huge events in some of the most damaging uh, one to two week storms in California. Those were Pineapple Expresses, and they were not related to El Nino. So when do we expect rain with El Nino? Well, we'll start seeing impact in November and December. It's not an on-off switch. And um, historically, we see the biggest impact in the latter half of the year. So that's important to remember, January through February. So it might take some time, but it doesn't mean we won't get some uh, increased storminess or above normal rainfall in November and December. Um, what can we expect like in the northeast? Well, with El Nino, it tends to be warmer like we showed on the map there, and you get less Arctic air. It doesn't mean you get no Arctic air. You're still going to get cold fronts. You're still going to get snow in New England. Um, but what it does mean is a mixed bag. So those in the northeast can prepare for pretty volatile winter where you see um, cold air come in and quickly warm air comes up from the Gulf and you get kind of the situation of rain on snow, or in worst case scenario, you get the freezing rain or the ice storm. Certainly, it doesn't mean we're going to see an ice storm like January um, of 1998. Everything has to come to play for that. That's kind of like the perfect storm or the worst case scenario. But do expect uh, a volatile winter with uh, a mixed bag of rain, snow, and even freezing rain because of it. Don't expect the winter like last year where the cold air was very locked in and the storm track brought incredible snow to like southern New England. Those are all great questions, though. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Again, um, we had some technical difficulties at the beginning. Uh, so if by the time you signed back in, you missed the beginning, we do have the entire webinar on uh, record. So we will be sending out a link to that. Also, if you know anybody that uh, tells you they tried to log in and it was during the time when we lost our internet connection, uh, no relation to El Nino or storms, just due to our IT issue here, um, we will be sending that out along with the questions. Everybody sent in a lot of questions. I'm sorry we don't have another like 20 minutes to answer them, but we'll be answering those on paper. So thank you again, um, and we really appreciate everybody tuning in. Have a good week.